So, thank you. Yes, Jacob, I work at uh, Tubo Technologies, as Travis said. And I'm going to talk about OAuth 2. I usually do, actually. Uh, we work a lot with OAuth. It's kind of everything we do, uh, that and OpenID Connect. And I guess a lot of you also do. You work the client side of OAuth. Maybe some of you have implemented a server side or used the server of OAuth. And it serves a lot of purposes for, for our environments that we deploy today and for our APIs. And it solves great use cases. But there's something coming up on the horizon that we need to start thinking about. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The Internet of Things is a lot of things. We don't, uh, I mean, I don't even know what it is, to be honest. Um, is it the fridge or is it the... Is it the watch or is it, well, it's probably everything, and that's the problem. So we're designing these big infrastructures now that can solve identity in a general way for us, for our APIs, for our apps, for our uh, websites, and this is coming. And it's going to hit us hard if we don't know what to do about it. So in this talk, I'm going to take you on a journey. Uh, I'm going to dive in a, a bit deep, I think, on what can OAuth do when we're talking about the Internet of Things. How does it even relate? What can it do? I'll try to skip, up the, skip the details of the specs that are, that are in the works, but I'll give you the gist of it. But in order to do that, we need to start with OAuth, because even though I know a lot of you know it, some of you don't. Um, OAuth consists of four actors. It is there for the resource owner, you, the user, to access something on the resource server, maybe it's pictures, um, through an app on the phone, perhaps the client. And then we have the fourth guy, the authorization server, uh, that helps in this case. So this user wants this app to access data on that resource server. That's what we're trying to do. But if any of you were on the workshop yesterday, you learned that OAuth does absolutely nothing in the area of authentication. So in order to solve this in a, in a way for the web at least, we need to add some sort of authentication service or server into the picture. So I do that just to separate the concerns. Um, so the flow starts like this. We have an app or a client of some sort, and it contacts the authorization server because um, it needs access to an API. The authorization server says, Sure, that's good, but I need you to authenticate the user first. I can't have you access that data if I don't know who the user is. So it turns around, goes to the authentication service, and the authentication service shows some way of authentication for the user, by hook or by crook. Uh, very commonly, a username password box that you enter something into. When that's done, the authentication service turns around and says, yeah, that was a successful authentication. The user is Jacob, and you can go ahead and do whatever you want, Mr. Authorization Server. And the AS, as we call that, issues an OAuth token. This was a bit simplified. It's actually a flow called the implicit flow in OAuth. There's more advanced flows, and we'll go into those. But this access token, it now can be used to contact the API. So it's sort of the contained identity and access information that just was authorized and delegated by the authorization server. So when the client sends this token to the API, it represents the user in a sense that it can check with the authorization server and see, was this a real user? Uh, do I know this one? Is it supposed to access me? Uh, is it still valid? Did it happen recently enough? And so on. And if so, it will respond with all your pictures. Travis talked two years ago how this could have been done with the snapping. It could have saved a few embarrassing moments, probably. You should look that up. <laughs> the access token, though. Let's talk about that a bit. This is, this is critical in OAuth in OAuth 2, and it's good to understand what this is. The access token is a piece of data, it's a string that we send around. But it is a particular type of string, or type of data, we should say, type of token. It's called a bearer token, which means it's like cash. If you find a $100 bill on the ground, you can pick it up, and you can go to the store, and you can buy yourself a T-shirt. You don't have to prove that you are entitled to use that bill, you can just use it. And that's exactly what an access token in OAuth is. 
and there are mechanisms in place to make sure that it still works, and there are reasons why it is like this, but it's a fact, and it's a very important fact to know that in OAuth, if you drop your access token on the floor, anyone can pick it up and can present themselves as you. So why does this work then? Why do people at all think OAuth is useful in this case? Well, there is, a, there is an axiom or a, or a base assumption of OAuth 2, or even it's not an assumption, it's actually in the spec, but it's so obvious that you probably forget it, and that is, well, you have to run OAuth 2 on TLS. There is no other option. You have to use HTTPS, and you have to run it encrypted. So if we, if we zoom in on what we just saw, we had a client who first talked to the authorization server. So that picture actually means that the client and the authorization server, they were talking on a secure line, at least. And on the internet, this works because we have an infrastructure for this on the internet. We have decided that, OK, we trust a number of parties or organizations that issue certificates, we call them. And these certificates state that when you go to this domain uh, and they present a certificate signed by us, you can trust that we check that they are who they say they are. That's kind of the base of, of HTTPS on the internet. So we have this trusted third party that gives us um, all these benefits that we can use in OAuth. So to summarize the sort of background before we dive into what we're really going to talk about, OAuth requires you to use TLS um, because we need to know and we need to trust the one we talk to. It's actually not bidirectional in OAuth, but that's details we can talk about on coffee. I'd be happy to. We use bearer tokens. We encrypt the communication on the transport layer, and it requires a massive trust infrastructure, the certificate system of the internet, HTTPS. So now we're going to talk about constrained environments. All of these goodies that we just mentioned don't exist. We're going to talk about an EKG device, perhaps, on the hospital. We're going to talk about a test tube that can perhaps measure the temperature of the thing it's holding, or I don't know, anything. They're all connected. That's what I'm seeing in the Internet of Things. And there's probably other better examples, but bear with me. So they're battery powered, maybe. They're probably mostly or always offline, meaning they can't connect to the Internet. Um, they have very limited calculation capabilities, and they're still an attractive target for an attack, obviously. So I'm not going to go into protocols, because the IoT is a lot about you know, inventing new protocols. How do we discuss? How do we talk between uh, this device and that device? What if it flies? What if it's connected to the wall? Um, I'm just going to say that there are a number of protocols. Here's a very select few out of them. Um, my point was simply that we cannot rely on the protocol, because there's going to be so many. Um, if we can, we can still use HTTP with HTTPS. HTTP2 is a great candidate, because it, it compresses the format slightly and becomes more attractive for IoT. But it's still probably too heavy for a device like a test tube or an EKG device. So other protocols like Co-op or, or XMPP and you name it have been invented and are probably coming to take over. So if we can't rely on the protocol on the transport layer, we need to rely on the protocol on the identity layer. So here's the example. We have a doctor using a device, an iPad or a tablet of some sort, and wanting to access uh, medical uh, equipment. And we don't anymore have this infrastructure of trust that the web gave us, or the internet. So let's go back to OAuth. We still have the authorization server in OAuth. We have our point of trust if we want to use it. So now, but we don't have the layer of security. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, we need to prove who we are. That's the basis for, for communicating with these devices securely. But we need to prove both who the user is and who the device is. That's really part of OAuth. So let's start again, and let's do it with another flow than we did before. This is the OAuth code flow. So let's assume the device is, this, this client here is a bit more powerful than, than most IoT devices. So it's a regular phone or something. So it can use regular OAuth. So it starts by calling the AS and saying, 
I need access to something. Um, the AES turns around to the authentication server, and in this case, since it's medical, you probably put in a key card or hold up an NFC communication thing or maybe scan your face, I don't know. Uh, go back, issue not a token this time, but a one-time code. This is the OAuth code flow. This one-time code is proof that the user is authenticated. It's not something you can use to access any data with. It's just proof. We, did, we authenticated the user, and the user is, has granted some access to this client that we're going to use. Now comes the interesting part here. How do we now take this into becoming a non-transport layer dependent token exchange? So we talk to the OWA server again and say, OK, I am this client. I have this secret that's been provisioned somehow. There are ways to do that. I want to read the EKG on the audience, the device, uh, EKG device ABC. Here's my authorization code that proves that the user authenticated and allowed me to do this. And here's a short-lived key. So the client generated a key. And this can be done in many ways. The server could also generate the key. But let's assume the client did it. It generated maybe a symmetric key or an asymmetric key, key pair. And it told the AS, I'm going to use this key. This key needs to be strong enough to not be crackable during the time the access token is valid. It doesn't have to be a lot stronger than that. So the authorization server says, yeah, great. I know who you are. Um, I'm going to issue you a token. This is a reference to something I keep in memory. Just take this string and go. And now we authenticated the client. So, with proof of possession, this is what this is called. We start a session against the device. We send over, not to the regular data endpoint, but we send over to another endpoint on the device, which is called um, AuthInfo, I think. Some of the protocols are discussing it to be called. But start session. And we send over our access token. And this time, we only use our access token once. Normally, we would use it on every request, but now we use it once. And when the device sees it, it, if it's a connected device, as in this case, it can ask the OWASP server, OK, so is this access token something that I should trust? And the OWASP server says, yeah. And when you do, here's the key that you should use when you talk to that device. And then the device says, yeah, OK, great, let's do it. And now they can start communicating securely using that shared key. Uh, asymmetric or symmetric, and uh, no one else knows that. Thus, the name proof of possession. So the client could prove that I had this access token, and when you get that, you will know which key I will use to talk to you. So not only do I have this access token, but I also know a key that no one else knows in the world except our shared trust party, the AS. And I can prove to you that I hold this, and the other guy can prove that he holds this. So they can communicate. Uh, securely, which means if you drop this access token on the floor, it's no longer a bearer token. You can't pick it up and use it, because you also have to know which key was generated with that access token. So we changed the way of how we use the access tokens, which means we're not relying anymore on the underlying transport layer security. We can create the application or message layer security if we need to. And we're probably gonna. I'm guessing these mes messages won't be standardized as much as they've been on the web, but that's up to someone else to see. So just another example. We had a device now that was fairly clever and could ask the OWA server, is this a valid token or not? What if we don't? What if the test tube is there? And the test tube is super stupid. It can do very few things, but it still has a processor. It's still a connected device. So we want to have the, this EKG device contact some test tube. That probably doesn't make sense at all. But in order to do that, let's assume now that the EKG device becomes the client. So it received the first incoming device, uh, incoming request, and then it was going to collect some data from other sensors, and it then needs to authenticate itself against the OWASP server to say, I'm about to contact someone else. 
Uh, perhaps it uses the original access token that it got to, to prove that it's supposed to do that for that user, or it skips that. There's a lot of ways this can be done. But it's saying, I want to read result, that's the scope, the permission it's seeking, on the device connected to 123. That's the audience. So only connected to 123 should accept a token with that audience. If anyone else sees that and receives that as a proof of uh, access, they should throw it away. It's not for me. It's only 2123. And once again, it produces some sort of key, or have the AS produce some sort of key, and put that in there, in the request. But we have a disconnected device. So the access token that gets returned this time is not this string that you shouldn't care about. It's another string you shouldn't care about called a JOT. And a JOT is a by-value token. That means it contains the data. The previous example I said was a string that referenced some data in the OWASP server, in the database probably there. This time, the OWASP server sends everything back. So it actually sends the key back in the access token in plain view to pick up. So it looks like this. To the left here, you have a JOT, a regular JOT. If you've seen these, they're kind of two JSON documents put together and usually signed um, in the bottom. So the left one is a signed one. Let's assume it could be encrypted, but it's not in this example. It says, I'm issued by issuer.company. That's the OWASP server, probably, uh, for the user, something. I'm meant for connected to 123. I include a nonce. So a nonce means not more than once. So the receiver of this token, when it sees a nonce, it should record that and remember, if I ever see this again, I'm going to ignore that new request. So it only accepts this shot once. And then it says, I expire at a certain time, I'm issued at a certain time, and CNF. I have a confirmation claim in there. So the OWASP server actually embedded something called the JWE. Anyone heard of that? That's a JOT, but encrypted. <laughs> JSON web encryption. So it put an encrypted JOT, another JOT, in the first JOT. And that's the right one there, the yellow one. And we can see that the body of that includes, actually, the key we just sent. So we, the OWASP server encrypted the key I gave it, put it in a token, and gave it back to me, and put it in a signed token that I could present to someone. So you're thinking, what, are you going to send JSON to a test tube? That sounds pretty stupid. And yeah, it probably is. So there's other formats, luckily, one called CWT, which is a Seabor web token. It's a binary version of a JSON. And there's probably more coming up as this goes. But it, it's actually exactly the same, I would say, at least in the content. So how does this work? Well. The resource server, the test tube, it trusts the authorization server. That's done off out of band. When you first got it, you pair them together somehow, transferring trust. So it knows if something is signed by that certificate, I trust it. Just like your browser trusts anything signed by VeriSign or so. You send the access token to the test tube. The test tube now doesn't have to ask the AOA server anything because it's already trusting it. And it can see, OK, it's a valid JOT. The signature is correct. It's for me. It's issued at the appropriate time. It extracts the JW in the middle. And it decrypts the J JWE. So now it has the secret key. And now we have secure communication without contacting the AOA server in the flow, uh, from at least from the last device. So. To conclude, OWASP is actually all about trust. However, it depends on TLS to do this on the internet. With proof of possession, which was this whole flow, I could prove that I had something uh, without telling you what it was. Um, we can solve the IoT case. Constrained environments can be online, they can be offline, and we can, lim we can scale our OWASP infrastructure to solve this. And it requires you to pre-provision trust because we don't have uh, the whole PKI world that we have on the internet, but that is a small price to pay. And we don't have to depend on application layer security for it. Thank you. That was all I had. Excellent.